about the ships coming over, or we talk about those that were here in grandiose numbers, and we lose the humanity in that sometimes. So thank you very much for work that you've produced. I think it's very important for society as a whole. Thank you. All right, my friends, um, let's shake, well, I was gonna say let's shake it up, because I like to shake it up at the events I go to. It's something that we do in non-violence training, but let's clap it one more time, y'all. <laughs> Jerry Gusto, um, professor here at Brown University. I think I think I got it. I learned um, two things from my elders, both here and in Africa, that are very important to me. And so I want to begin my remarks with those two things. The first thing is that whenever you are standing on soil, where the bones of others may be buried deep down below, you begin everything with a salutation of respect to them, even if they're unseen or unknown or unrecognized. So I want to do that first. And secondly, and this is from my grandmother, she always told me, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. In the matter of tonight, what I have is a little knowledge. There are numerous scholars, some of them my colleagues here at Brown, who are making the study of Indian slavery one of the focuses of their work. More importantly, there are historians of the nations and of the communities of Native Americans and others in this region who know far more than I do about the history of Indian slavery. So my task is to try not to be dangerous, in honor of my grandmother, yet add something useful to the collective pot so that we can have a good discussion. I'm going to do that by focusing on a few thoughts around the question of Indian slavery, which have come up in my own work. That work is not so much about slavery as it is about the kinds of interactions, usually contested and in conditions of violence and duress, but also which occasion the exchange of knowledge, which took place between indigenous people, enslaved Africans, and colonizing Europeans in the Americas and in Southern Africa. In the interest of time, I want to do this by images. I hope that this setup works. If not, you're going to have to imagine what I'm saying. And I'll give the briefest of remarks about three historical spaces on which my thoughts have been focused in the past, over the past decade. And we might be able to return to some of them later or on another occasion. The first set is going to be about Dutch Brazil and the early 17th century sugar plantations. The second set is from New England to the Caribbean. And the third set is Long Island, from Long Island to Providence, and the Harlem Renaissance. And we'll see if this actually works. Yeah, OK. Except that's not the right one. <laughs> it's OK. These are just covers of the kinds of uh, natural histories, in other words, the colonial archive that I spend a lot of time looking at. So you get very old histories of the first European natural historian who goes to Barbados or to Jamaica or to Brazil or to Haiti. A lot of these are actually held in uh, here, original copies, in the John Carter Brown Library. I want to spend a moment on this one, which is from Brazil. This is actually the first natural history of Brazil. You can see the European imagination working and how they see uh, the Native Americans, or the Tupi Namba people, as they call themselves, in Brazil. And the interesting thing about this, uh, this old first natural history of Brazil for me is that I'm always thinking about the knowledge of plants. In the, so the knowledge that African, enslaved Africans and 
in this case in Brazil, the enslaved Tupinamba, because everywhere in Latin America, it's first the Native Americans who were enslaved, and then when that doesn't work in some kind of way, Africans are brought in. So the reason why this book is important, done by Willem Pizzo and George Margraff, is that it was done in the time when the Dutch briefly held Brazil. Now we know Brazil is a Portuguese colony, but in the 15, 1640s, the Dutch were holding Brazil, and the governor, uh, Count Moritz of Nassau, thought it important to do scientific studies. So he brings over Willem Pizzo to look at questions of plants and the knowledge about plants. And in this time, we remember that the knowledge about plants is like knowing where gold and diamonds and oil are later on in history. So Pizzo does this book. And what do you find when you see the book is that the Tupinamba and the enslaved Africans are there on these early sugar plantations at the same time. And they're exchanging knowledge with each other. Most of the book is about what he calls the simples, which are the medicinal plants, the herbal medicines of the Tupinamba. But occasionally you find a page like this one that's shown there, where he reports that the Africans are teaching the Indians how, or the indigenous people, how to use particular plants. And so you begin to get a notion of the plants that the Africans managed to bring over or that were brought over in the slave ship, like sesame, eggplant, and okra. And you also get a sense of how the Tupinamba are teaching the enslaved Africans about some very important plants, usually maize, but also cassava, which is the bread of the Caribbean. It's the bread of the Tainos, it's the bread of the Brazilians. The terms that were being used by the Portuguese and the Dutch at this time are also interesting. They called the Tupinamba in the beginning when they enslaved them, Negros da Terra, the blacks of this land. And the ones who were coming in from Guinea and from Angola, and that's the first set, they are Negros de Guinea and Negros de Angola. It's an interesting use of the notion of color and slavery. And the picture on the lower right, what you see is, it looks like they're trying to depict Africans, but actually this is an early depiction of Tupinamba, who are enslaved and who are put to producing the bread, this bread called cassava or cassava, depends on which part of the Caribbean or Latin America you're in. And these were first enslaved Tupinamba who have to produce this bread. So for me, this is an interesting evidence of not just the enslavement, joint enslavement side by side of Native Americans and enslaved Africans, but also of the knowledge they exchanged and the knowledge and the wealth of knowledge that they bring to the colonizers. This picture is a picture in Africa of Angola, the city of Luanda, and at the same time that the Dutch are holding this part, this tip of Brazil as part of their um, at their empire, they're also briefly in charge of or colonizing the Angola Kingdom. They never get quite to colonize the Congo Kingdom, but the Angola Kingdom in Luanda. This is the oldest fort, one of the oldest forts on the coast of Africa. It's uh, San Miguel de Luanda, built in 1576. And the interesting thing is that when the Dutch, built by the Portuguese, when the Dutch take Luanda briefly in the 1640s, they bring over Tupi Namba masons, stone masons, sailors on the boats. And some of those Tupi Namba escape altogether. They melt into the kingdoms, what were then the kingdoms of Congo and Dongo. So one interesting research question for me is sort of like the disappeared Taino. Where did these people go? And what would thinking about them teach us about slavery and the relations among Africans? And, and Native Americans with respect to slavery, and not just slavery. This is a picture with which I'm sure it depicts things that most people in this region would be familiar with, which is uh, the massacre of the Pequod in 1937 in Connecticut. This is one of the beginnings of a massive deportation of Native American people from New England to the Caribbean. So it then posits another question, where did these people go? They go to everywhere in the Caribbean. They go to the Bahamas, they go to Barbados, they go to Jamaica. So when I was a child, probably like many of you who are at least my age or older, we were always taught the Indians, the Native Americans are largely disappeared. I have there a quote from Herman Melville, the book that we all had to read in school, Moby Dick, 
where he says, you know, the name of the boat, the ship is the Pequod, first of all, and we don't even know why it's the Pequod when we're reading it. But he says, you will no doubt remember the Pequod was the name of a celebrated tribe of Massachusetts Indians now extinct as the ancient Medes. So he's writing this in 1851, but these supposedly extinct people, many of them are not just still here in New England, but are also in the Caribbean. And in fact, one of the things that was most astonishing to me in trying to do the research of black people and Native Americans side by side in this question of slavery is an intra-American slave trade that went on in the Caribbean, a waterborne traffic, they didn't cross the Atlantic, but was going around in the Caribbean, was a very, very large flow of slavery. The estimate now is that over a period of 400 years, more than 2.5 million Native persons, many of them from New England, were in slavery in the Caribbean. This is besides the Taino who lived there. This is another set. And this saltwater trade expelled them all over the Caribbean to Little Bonaire and Curaçao, to the many small Lucayas, to Hispaniola, and to Puerto Rico. In fact, one study done by Resendez, which is called The Other Slavery, is that in the period between 1670 and 1720, from the Carolinas, South Carolina in particular, more Indians were exported out of Charleston, South Carolina, than Africans were imported into Charleston, South Carolina. So one of the chief things that I've been doing in trying to do research about botanical knowledge in the Caribbean is looking at this question of black people and Native Americans, or enslaved Africans and enslaved Native Americans living side by side during a period when we were told, at least when I was in school, that all these people had disappeared. So you get, for example, the famous work by um, Hans Sloan in Jamaica. And if you read the archive, if you read the original, which uh, many of these originals are in uh, Brown's JCB library, you get this understanding that these supposedly disappeared Indians and these enslaved Africans are actually living side by side for quite some time in many of the Caribbean countries. This is a quote just from Jamaica, from the Natural History of Jamaica done by one Hans Sloan, in which he talks over and over again about the Indians and the Negroes, the Indians and the Negroes, even Indian and Negro doctors, and the diseases that they were able to cure using plants that were natural to Jamaica. And deep inside the book, the Hans Sloan book, is an account of a Lucaya, which is the other name for the, for the Bahamas, a Lucaya couple enslaved in Hispaniola and how they tried to get away. And then they returned to slavery. So you have to ask yourself, um, we all learn in school about how Native Americans disappeared in the United States, supposedly, how they disappeared as well in the Caribbean, but they show up over and over again in these natural histories. So one of the things that also shows up in these old colonial histories is a question of Native American revolt, enslaved African revolt, and how afraid the colonists up and down the East Coast and down into the Caribbean were of this revolt. So in 1502, you get one of the earliest ones where the Spanish governor of Hispaniola asks the king of Spain. Essentially, he just says, please don't send me any more of these African slaves. Let's have a moratorium. Because they run away to the mountains of Hispaniola, which today is Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and they don't come back. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, they pair up with the Native Americans who are the Taino who are fleeing, and we don't know what's going on up in the mountains, but it's dangerous, so let's just have a moratorium. You move to 1676, and this is from a study done by um, Professor Linford. Yeah, where are you? I think he's here somewhere. <laughs> exactly. One of his early studies. Uh, because he continues to do this work. Dangerous designs, the 1676 Barbados Act to, prevent, to prohibit New England Indian slave importation. 
they were by now very, very afraid of these Native Americans who had revolted and who almost won the war in this region. And so several thousands of them are deported. And the, the governor in, down in Barbados says that, you know, he really doesn't want any more of these. Many of them are already there, but he says he really doesn't want any more of these because it's like a contagion to have them. These Native American uprisings that are taking place in Virginia and Maryland and New York, and now these people are deported or sold down into the Caribbean and causing trouble. This happens over and over again in the Caribbean. I have, the quote at the bottom is from a famous um, Caribbean poet and historian, Kamau Brathwaite, and he writes a poem about, just part of it, is about the Maroon Coast in Barbados, which many people think, oh, there weren't any Native Americans left there. And he writes about the ones that got away the ones that found a settlement somewhere on the coast, which they call the Maroon Coast of Barbados. And he talks about how they got away and how important it is that they found their freedom. And something wrong. Yes. So the reason why this is called Native, Amer Native Revolt, Black Revolt, and Colonial Fears is that this question of Native Americans and not yet African Americans, but enslaved Africans joining together in, revo in possible revolt was one of the biggest fears of colonial times. Finally, I want to talk about, um, briefly about how shall I call this? By then, this is a question of a cultural resistance. It's basically what we're left with in the New England area. And this woman, usually you get, um, you get to see histories about, uh, what's the name, um, Cuffey? Paul, Paul Cuffey. Cuffey, yes. So I thought I would use a woman instead of Paul Cuffey because he's fairly well known. This lady is called Olivia Ward Bush. And she was both, um, Native American and African American, and she writes a very famous poem, at least famous in the time, in 1898 in Newport, called Driftwood. And although it's a fairly sad-seeming poem, it's actually a poem about resistance. It's actually a poem about um, the fact that, like Driftwood, the Native Americans, who by then are very much mixed in this area of New England with African Americans, still manage to endure. And in the final part, she says that um, with their lives, some poor misshapen remnant still survives of what was once a fair and beauteous form, and yet some dwelling may be more bright. Someone afar may catch a gleam of light after the fury of the blighting storm. This poem is actually a poem about resilience of Native Americans in this New England region. So I want to close with that. I actually had closed with something else, but I didn't bring it with me, which is a weaving, a carving that um, the Narragansett have kept for a long time, a weaving, which is about the dispersal of the Narragansett through the Caribbean, because I think that also speaks to a kind of history that we want to understand more. So, in conclusion, I want to close with what I hope that some of what I've sketched tonight leads us to think about. The kinds of projects where the historians of the nations and communities, the colonial archives, and a rereading not just of the secrets buried in the soil, but the wisdom inserted in poems and songs, in weavings and carvings, might bring us a greater understanding of the historical phenomenon of Indian slavery in the Americas. I want to suggest that this could lead us not just to new histories of what my friends on the Bahian coast of Brazil call the people of the waters, but new works on the nature of rebellion and revolts for freedom and for sovereignty in the Americas, from the eastern woodlands to Barbados and Brazil, and a different kind of critical triangulation of our knowledge about slavery in this old world, it's not a new world, in this old world and the Americas. I think Brown, with its new Native American and Indigenous Studies initiative, could be becoming a good place to try that out. Thank you.
that. She knows how to work. She knows how to work. Well, come on down. Let's please give it up one more time. That was fascinating. Absolutely. And the idea that that story is not being told of the natives being shipped elsewhere. I'm surprised Hollywood hasn't told that story. Or am I surprised? <laughs> but thank you very much for that. I want to, I want to do the slideshow here. Do I touch it? This is the, you gonna do that? I found it. Do you know how to do this? Mm -hmm. There we go. Is it working? Is it working? All right. You just gonna stop it. I'm not gonna touch it. See what happens. Um, you know, it's it's odd that uh, I'm gonna be talking about um, some of these topics as they as they have extended into the 20th century. Um, I'm, I teach in the anthropology department at Rhode Island College. But I'm an archaeologist, so it's interesting that the archaeologist ends up talking about the 20th century, um, and it's 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 not ironic because um, we are using sort of the techniques of archaeology to um, explore the treatment of children uh, who were incarcerated at a state institution right here in Rhode Island. So uh, it's an interesting process to think about how we might be able to look um, at more, more recent um, problems and issues. Um, when I first came to Rhode Island back in 1978, I want to tell a few stories. Um, I, I had uh, been working out west. <clears throat> I'd been working in New Mexico, um, done quite a bit of work with uh, people who uh, are of historically Taos Indians and uh, uh, Picaris and Mescalero and Diné and um, I'd been raised in New England <clears throat> but I spent you know a decade or so working out west and so in 1978 I came to Rhode Island College uh, to to run a, a contract program to do applied archaeology in, in in Rhode Island and one of the first things I heard was that there aren't any Indians here. I mean, why would you want to come here? 